There are some useful operators and functions that you can use while doing mutate. These are just general R operators and functions, but they are particularly useful in the context of mutate. So let's take an example here. So we've got a transmute flights departure time and notice that departure times are recorded in the military format. So for example, 5, 6, 520 means 520 AM or 2240 means 1040 PM, right? So you want to find, let's say from that, you want to find the hour and the minute, right? So here we are saying hour is departure time percent slash percent 100, okay? Now this is not just the regular division operation. Percent slash percent is the integer division operation which gets you the quotient. That is you're completely ignoring the remainder and seeing how many times it goes in. So that's the quotient operator. So for example, suppose your time was 1030. You divide it by 100 integer division, the result is 10, right? The remaining 30 is the remainder. 1030 divided by 100 is 10 remainder 30. Okay, so that's what you get here. So that's what you achieve by this percent slash percent operator. And the remainder is a minutes and the operator to get the remainder on an integer division is percent percent. That's the operator you get, you use to get the remainder. Now these are quite used quite often in programming contexts and therefore I thought you should know about it. Okay, so here you can see 517 was the time is broken up into 517, 533, etc. So 517 was divided by, in, uh, integer divided by 100, so you got a quotient of 5, so that's what you're seeing here, the quotient of 5, and then you had the remainder of 17, that's what you're seeing here. Okay, so that's how this is working. And also mutate need not always refer only to the table columns, as I've already mentioned. So here, for some reason, I want to add a sequence number to every row of the table, okay? Maybe for some purpose, I'm going to do some flipping around of the rows, re rearranging the rows in some way. But for some purpose, I also need to know the original row number, so I cannot afford to lose that. So in order to do that, I'm creating a new column called sequence number, okay? And I'm using the function row number to fill that particular column, okay? So row number obviously will be, for the first row it will be one, for the second row it will be two, and so on, okay? So now you can see uh, fly fl underscore one is the new, uh, uh, new table that I'm creating. As a result of this operation, I'm assigning that. And from that, I'm seeing show me the sequence numbers one to six. And of course, as I expect, they are one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Now, why you might want to do this would be for certain purposes. Like I said, you're going to rearrange it, but you want the original sequence maintained for whatever reason, then you can use a function like this, okay? I'm just showing it as an example that you can create a new column in whatever form, uh, in whatever, using whatever method that is required for the context. You don't have to create a new column only based on existing columns, okay? And you, you can do more general things as well. That's what we are trying to point out here. And we are using the row number function. Some additional functions. Okay, so here I'm just creating a vector with the values 1 to 10 and lag of x. Okay, this is one something that I had discussed in the recitation. Lag of x is nothing but the values of the vector x lagged by 1. So the first value becomes NA, the second value becomes the first, the third value becomes the second, fourth value becomes the third, etc. This is particularly useful in the context of time series, right? If this were a time series, then lag of x is the same time series lagged by one time period, okay? So by default, the lag function lags by one time period, but if you want larger lags, you can specify that as the next argument. So you say lag x comma 3, then you'll get the same time series lagged by 3. That's all. Lead of x again is just the opposite of lag. Okay, so obviously uh, you'll get the time period, the data from the time period, one time period forward, not backward. Okay, so which is why the last value is NA and the first value is 2. 
right? Because in the first uh, point, you're going to get the value which is in the second time period of x, which is 2, 3, etc. So these are some useful functions, uh, lag and lead, when operating with time series. There are other useful functions as well. So for example, you can do a cumulative sum of x, right? That is, uh, the initial value of cumulative sum will be 1. The next value will be 1 plus 2, which is 3. And the next value will be 3 plus 3, 6, and 6 plus 4, 10. It's a cumulative sum, a running total of a particular vector. dplyr also has a function called cummean, which is a cumulative mean. So the mean of the first value, of course, is 1. The cummean at the second position is the cumulative sum, 3, divided by the number of elements, 2, 1.5. And the sum of the first three elements is 6. Therefore, the cumulative mean of the first three elements is 2, and so on. So you get the sequence 1, 1.52, 2.53, 3.54, etc. OK, so cum sum is just the running total. Cum mean is the cumulative mean, which is the mean at any particular point, starting from the beginning. Going on to more functions. So here, I'm creating a vector with just the values 1, 2, 2, 3, 4. And there's a function called min rank, and what it tells you is the rank of each number, right? So this first, this number one is ranked one because it's the lowest element. Number two is ranked two because it's the second lowest element. And when we say min rank, all twos will have the same rank. Okay, so two, this two and this two are both the second highest element in the vector. Na, of course, doesn't have any rank. Three has the fourth rank within the set of numbers, right? Because the first rank is 1, second rank is 2, the other second rank is 3, and the third rank is skipped because the third rank is taken away by this. So this becomes 4 and 5. That is min rank. There's another thing called dense rank, which will not count these duplicates. So you will get this result, 1, 2, 2, Na, 3, 4, in the sense that uh, 3 is the third highest element of the vector, not counting the fact that 2 has occurred twice. So this is the first rank, 2 is the second rank, 3 is the third rank, and 4 is the fourth rank. That's what you get here. So this is just uh, an additional function. These are two additional functions that you can use with mutate. OK, so now let's just see some applications of mutate. Convert departure time and schedule departure time to show the number of minutes since midnight. This will make them easier to compute with. Now, as you have seen, when you look at departure time and scheduled departure time, they are stored in military format like, you know, 0517 or 517. 517 is really 517 AM. Okay? So if you want to calculate time differences, you cannot just subtract scheduled departure times or uh, departure times, right? Because then you'll get the wrong answer. So in order to do those computations, it's better if all of these times are recorded in terms of the number of minutes elapsed since midnight, right? So for example, 517 will be 5 hours, which is 300 minutes plus 17. So 517, the departure time of 517, 517 AM is really 317 minutes since midnight. Right? So if you had another flight which departed at 6.17, okay? and if you simply try to subtract 5.17 minus uh, 6.17 minus 5.17, you'll get 100, which is wrong. You should only get 60, and you'll get that correct if you convert both of them into number of minutes elapsed since midnight. So that's what we are trying to do here. So we are saying mutate flights, departure time is departure time integer divided by 100 times 60, okay? So 517 will become 5 times 60, that's 300, plus the remainder on by, by 100, so plus 17, it will become 317 minutes. And same with scheduled departure time as well, okay? So this is how you can convert it, uh, convert those times into number of minutes elapsed since midnight. OK, but you do see the code duplication here, right? We are doing both of these uh, the exact same thing. We are repeating a lot of code. So one way to handle this code duplication, and again, we are not going to be using this extensively in the course, but in general, a programming concept, is to create a function to do the job, 
right? So here, wouldn't it be nice if we had something that could take in a time and convert it into the number of minutes since midnight, right? Then we could just use that same that thing here, and you you could use the reuse the same thing here. It's just like what we do in Excel. We have so many functions, and we keep reusing them, right? We don't write things again and again exactly the same thing. In programming, these things are called functions, and here we are showing you a function to do this operation. So time converter is the name of the function and I'm saying here time converter is a function and you define a function like this by saying function and then what are its inputs. This particular function takes only one argument so we say input time and the function definition begins with an open brace and we are saying input time whatever the input time is integer division by 100 times 60 plus input time reminder 100 okay so if the input time was 517 this will become 5 times 60 300 plus the remainder 17 317 okay and then we close the brace to indicate the function is done okay again I'm just showing this to you to sort of get you acquainted with the fact that we can write our own functions and not simply use functions that R has but that said, for the most part in this course, in, the, in fact in this whole certificate sequence, we will not be writing our own functions at all. This might in fact be the only place where you see a user-defined function. These are called user-defined functions. Okay. So now with this function in place, we can write the following. We can say mutate flights, departure time equals time converter departure time. Okay. So we are using this time converter function just as if it was a function given to us by R. Now, this is a user defined function. So we are passing the departure time as an argument. So if you pass 517, this will get converted into 317 and that will get assigned to departure time. Scheduled departure time, same thing except we pass scheduled departure time as an argument. Okay. So this looks a lot cleaner than the code that we had in the previous page, namely this right because all the mechanics that we are doing here have been replaced by just calling function okay in fact just using this example of a function you will actually be able to write some simple functions quite easily so because of the fact that arrival time and departure time was re are recorded based on the local times at the corresponding airports and they may not be in the same time zone and therefore, obviously, arrival time to air time to is not going to match air time. Okay. How will we fix the problem? Well, maybe we can fix the problem by recording all of these times in GMT or something. Right. So that the time zone effect is removed. And if you did that, then air time two and air time one uh, and air time will actually match. Okay, so the problems are happening because of time zone differences and also as we said earlier the military format of the times. We know how to fix all of those things uh, but we are not going to take that any further.